Praise God, that song will preach. I don't even need to be up here. Can we just focus on the words on that song? Good night, everybody. That was a great segue. Uh, love that song. All right, so as Pastor mentioned, um, I'm Travis Johnson. I'm currently the Assistant Dean of Students at Karis Bible College in Colorado. Uh, I've been employed in ministry now for almost six years, and I'm a graduate as well. Uh, I did three years uh, of school uh, at, the, at uh, Karis Bible College, Colorado, and uh, my third year was a focus on ministry. Uh, just so you know, our standard educational program is, is two years. Uh, but graduates can study in additional years with a focus uh, in the Colorado campus of ministry, business, media, worship, creative arts, and practical government. And then we're also going to be adding uh, two more for this coming up year. Uh, this trip is comprised of me. Uh, I'm the staff lead is what they call me. Uh, my lovely wife, Barbara, she has no authority other than me. She's, she's in charge of me just like at home. Uh, <laughs> Ten second-year students um, that are very excited to be here and to serve you guys and my excellent third-year intern uh, that helps lead and guide the team. And so uh, they had many trips to choose from, and uh, they specifically chose this one. And I believe it's because God wants them here, and, and they really have uh, a fresh message of love, uh, not only for you folks here in England, we'll be going to Belfast uh, in a few days, and so I really believe that God has each and every one of these team members on this specific team uh, to minister to you guys. Uh, I actually was telling Pastor before that I wanted to come to the UK when I was a first year student. My whole first year I wanted to come to the UK and at that time it was England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And my whole first year, that's what I wanted to do. And then when it came time for second year, uh, the head of our missions department brings out a form and it lists all the trips the points required to go on that trip and what's required on the trip, like whether it's teaching, dramas, all of this. And so I'm looking down the list, beginning of my second year, and I'm looking for the UK trip. No, I'm looking down the list, there's Germany, I was stationed there, I'm going down the list, there's Russia, no. And, and I'm looking for the UK, and here's Hungary and Serbia. And I, I'm so big, guys, I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. And I had a ding in here, if you know what I'm talking about. There was a ding, that's it. And so there's no guarantee you get your first trip, but I, I just, I was so sure. I marked it down. That's where I was going. And you get, I got a second choice. I put Belize or something. I just kind of phoned it in. I didn't really think about where, you know, I was so sure that's where I was going. And I did go there. And then God changed my heart. Holy Spirit again, back, back, doing his usual business. He changed my heart for Russia. And I went to Russia as a third year student, and it was wonderful. Uh, Russian people are fantastic. And so I really feel like God is honoring me uh, just for my faithfulness, getting to finally come to the UK. Uh, I've just wanted to come here my entire life. A uh, little bit about me, not that there's anything particularly interesting, uh, but it's helpful in understanding the heart behind the message I have for you today. Uh, I'm 48 years old. I'll be 49 on March 5th, so you still have a few shopping days left. Thanks, God. Just want to throw that out there. Uh, I'm originally from, my wife and I are originally from the state of Oregon. So if you're looking at a map of the United States, if you go all the way to the west coast to crazy fornia i mean california and you go up one state that's our that's our home state of oregon and we're from the northwest part of that state and so the climate is essentially identical to the uk so we really feel like we're at home right here uh, as i mentioned i was stationed in germany for a couple of years in the late 80s and early 90s and uh, i got to travel some in europe and always wanted to come across the channel to visit you guys and it just never worked out so i just really feel blessed to be here uh, my wife and I, we have three excellent children, two boys and a girl. Um, our oldest boy is 20, and he's actually a first-year winter term student at Karis Bible College. I couldn't have scripted that. That just, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, ministry was actually the furthest thing from my mind. Um, you know, most of my formative years were spent on our family farm. Um, my grandparents growing up, they raised berries, but they couldn't make enough money selling strawberries and blackberries and boysenberries to even pay the taxes on the property. And so they started leasing it to a nursery farmer, a local tree grower, and uh, my uncle who lived on the farm as well, when their lease ran out, he started up you know, growing trees himself. 
and made me work for him. It was semi-forced labor. He didn't pay me, but I felt like an indentured servant. And uh, so I grew up in the nursery business. Uh, but my wife had been telling me for years that um, the Lord had a calling on my life. And uh, I wasn't listening. I wasn't rebellious. Um, you know, I just didn't believe it was the Lord. And now, in retrospect, it's funny how often my wife's voice and the Holy Spirit sound exactly the same. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, when I made the decision, you know, and of course, aided by God to answer the call, I had no idea what, what I was in for. You know, coming to Bible college, it's been some of the most challenging years of my life, but it's also been some of the most fruitful. Um, so I encourage you, if there's anything... You know, the Lord has put on your heart to step out in faith and follow the Holy Spirit. You know, I've grown in ways I never could have imagined, been used in ways that I never could have predicted. Um, and I can't put a price on what I've learned. And it's all been just the grace and favor of God. And He's no respecter of persons. That same grace He has for me, He has for you. That same favor He has for me, He has for you. Um, it's amazing what God can do in your life if you're just faithful. Um, the second part of um, Psalms 18.35, and, and David says the same thing in 2 Samuel 22.36. Uh, most translations say, your gentleness makes me great. I actually like how the NIV says it the best. It says, you stoop down to make me great. And so if you're just faithful and do what the Lord is calling you to do, uh, there's no telling what he can do in your life. You know, if you just purpose in your heart to be humble and faithful, uh, you give God a blank canvas to paint a masterpiece with your life. I'm living proof of him taking something blank and, and starting to apply brush strokes. Uh, but what I've been asked to speak a, a, on today is praying for the sick. And when I was putting this teaching together, you know, it's funny. Where do you think, if you're going to preach on praying for the sick and healing, where do you think you're going to get attacked? Where does the enemy get attacked at? In your health. Yeah. Amen. That's exactly what happened. Um, battled insomnia a month before I left on this trip. I uh, actually didn't sleep at all last night. I've been up now, praise the Lord, 27 hours. Hallelujah. That's why my hair looks the way it does. Uh, but it doesn't matter. You know, when you rely on the Holy Spirit, He gives you the strength you need. Uh, I'm going to be transparent with you guys. There are many things we know about healing. Many, many things. And there's still some things we don't have answers on. And while I'm not an expert on healing, um, the Lord has flowed through me many times to administer healing, and some have been really serious health issues for folks. Uh, and we know, like I said, he's no respecter of persons, and so if he does it through me, he will do it through you. Truthfully, Jesus is the only expert on healing, amen? Uh, he is the healer. He is the great physician. All we do is take the authority he has given us and we use it to remove sickness and disease in this realm. You know, it's important for me to share what the Lord has for you today and not just regurgitate what a lot of others teach on the subject. So I was praying about it. You know, I've learned some wonderful things about healing at Bible college and, uh, you know, just in praying for the sick as well. And then the Lord has showed me some other things along the way. So I'm really hoping it blesses you guys. Uh, and I'll also add that I'm still learning and growing in the area of healing. I'm still learning and growing. Not only in how to administer it more effectively, but how to help people appropriate it more effectively. Because a certain part of healing resides in receiving. Yeah. It really does. It resides, you know, just receiving by faith what Christ has already done, what he's already provided. We're going to talk about that shortly. But what I'd like to do today is just lay a foundation for healing. You know, talk about some practical aspects of how to pray for the sick. And then I'd like to finish up with giving you all an opportunity to pray for each other. And uh, I think that'll be good. Uh, let me start by sharing something that God recently showed me regarding grace and healing. Um, grace for me is, is pivotal. It really is. And uh, in terms of grace and healing, the Lord showed me how one actually provides for the other. You know, you can take it or leave it, but this is what he revealed to me. I was just really focusing on his grace. Have you ever spent time with the Lord where you're just kind of focusing on a certain aspect and then all of a sudden you get a download and you're trying to keep up with what he's telling you? It's almost like somebody that is a, an auctioneer and, they're, and you're trying to write down everything they say. That's how it can be with the Holy Spirit sometimes. And so he, I'm just kind of focusing on grace and he just downloads this. And, and it's how grace ties into healing. And it was basically at the crux of healing. 
and its inner core and its foundation is grace. His undeserved, unmerited favor. He showed me that his healing power actually originates in grace, flows to the recipient through speaking his word and prayer, <coughs> and faith enables the person you're praying for to receive. You know, right now we have power supply to this building uh, from a power station. It flows here through, through cables and wires and conduit. And we access it by using these wall sockets, you know, when we plug a device in. So God showed me that grace is that power station generating the healing power. The word and prayer is the conduit that actually delivers it to the person you're praying for. And faith is like plugging in the device to receive this healing power. And so while I'm thinking about that, he just kind of downloads Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And so I'm going to go to that verse right now. You can follow along if you'd like. So that's Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. But he just it's like he just brought this scripture right up to my mind. And so if you don't have your Bible out, um, I'll read it for you. For by grace you have been saved. And so that saved caught me initially. It's like... I bet it's sozo. I bet it's not soteria. Mm -hmm. So let me continue. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. And so my hunch was right. That word saved is the Greek word sozo. And according to Thayer's Greek lexicon, it means to save, keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction, to save a suffering one from disease, to make well, to heal, to restore to health. So let's read it again with that in mind. For by grace you have been saved from suffering a disease, made well, healed, and restored to health through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Then he pointed out the gift of God in that last portion of verse 8. The Greek word for gift there is doron, and it means gift, but it also means offering and sacrifices and other gifts offered to God. Also notice it says the gift and not a gift. That's important. Who is the gift of God to mankind? Jesus. Jesus. Who is the sacrifice offered to God on our behalf? Jesus. Jesus. So now let's read it one last time. For by grace you have been saved from suffering a disease. You've been made well. You've been healed and restored to health through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the Christ of God, the Jesus of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This grace comes from Jesus' sacrifice, which provides for our healing. This isn't just talking about being saved. Amen? Continue on in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you realize the Lord has prepared beforehand divine appointments for you to administer healing in someone else's life? Isn't that amazing? God has actually predestined you to do those things. That you should walk in them. That should excite you. And actually, here's something that's worth the price of admission. You can actually administer healing to yourself. We're going to touch on that in just a moment. But what I'd like to do now is just lay a foundation for healing. Okay? God is still in the healing business. It's part of the new covenant. The truth is, he never got out of the healing business. The problem is the enemy brought in the lie that, well, you know, God doesn't do that anymore. That was for the, the apostles. And that was in the, you know, at the end of the New Testament. And that was, you know, the super dupers. And that was, you know, no, he doesn't do that now. He, does, he just doesn't heal now. And the problem is a large portion of the body of Christ has believed that. They bought into that lie. And so despite all, despite all the miraculous healings, they still maintain that mindset. <laughs> And when you do that, you can't operate in the healing power of God. You know, it's interesting. I mentioned uh, my nursery business background. That's actually what I was doing. I was helping run our family farm before I moved here to, to Colorado in, in 2011. And uh, we had a local farmer come by. And I don't remember what he was looking for. If he was borrowing a piece of equipment or maybe 
Uh, sometimes we'll trade cuttings off of trees to graft to make to grow new ones. And so he came to the farm, and uh, I was there with our farm manager. And uh, he just off the cuff mentioned that his wife had a really bad back issue, and she'd been dealing with it, been a lot of pain. And uh, I wasn't a student yet, and I was going to what we call a men's advance. And that's where and you get 800 to 1,000 men all in the same building listening to teaching and worshiping God, and it's just an amazing experience. And so I said, hey, great news, Tim. I'm going to uh, the men's advance. I would be happy to get you some healing resources. They've got tremendous healing resources. And he looked at me very sternly and said, we don't believe that. I was incredulous. You would not believe God for healing for your wife's back. Meanwhile, she's tormented. You know, she's gone to several doctors, like the woman with the issue of blood. They didn't spend all their money, but she'd gone to several doctors. No success. And yet when I tried to encourage him, hey, I'm going to get you some healing resources, you know, very sternly, no, we don't believe that. It's like our founder, uh, Andrew Womack, always says, you know, despite the fact that that's in the Bible, that healing's in the Bible, you know, they don't believe that. It's like our founder always says, most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. You know, they're going to believe what they want to believe. But it's the traditions and doctrines of men that make the Word of God a non effect. You know, God healed people in the Bible, correct? Yes. Yeah. Hebrews 13.8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he healed in the Bible and he never changes, why would he not heal today? It would be a violation of his character to not continue to heal. And we are actually in unbelief to not expect him to heal our bodies now. One of his names is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. The truth is God's very nature is healing. And it's his, it's his will. And you guys need to just really get this firm in your foundation. It is his will to heal every single time. Amen. Every single time. He heals our earthly relationships, including our marriages. You know, he heals our emotions. Um, why would he stop there and not heal our physical bodies? It just doesn't make any sense. Think about this. When you get cut, your skin heals itself, doesn't it? Okay, if you break a bone, your bone heals. You don't have to think about it. Your bone just starts healing. If you get sick, your immune system kicks in to fight off whatever type of sickness is in your body. Think about this. Healing is so important to God that he hardwired it into our very cells of our body. It is literally hardwired into our DNA to heal. Another false doctrine still permeating the body of Christ today is that God puts sickness and disease on people to teach them a lesson. Okay, which is another major contradiction to Scripture. And it's interesting, these are the same people that, while they believe that, they go to the doctor when they're sick. And so they're not learning the lesson, apparently, that God wants to teach them. That is a complete fallacy. God does not put sickness on anyone. Certainly not to teach him a lesson. I mean, he would be a really poor teacher to have to put cancer on, on you to teach you something. That's not his will, that's not his heart. It's, it's completely out of his character. Jesus clearly tells us in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes only but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. That's his heart. Now here we see the, seat of the thief, uh, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy our health. There's many things he's trying to steal from us. He's trying to kill us. He's trying to destroy us. And, and health is a major one. But Jesus came that we might have life more abundantly. And the Greek word actually there means super abundantly or superior in quality. Satan came to steal our health and Jesus came not only to return it, but to give it back to us super abundantly. Also, God's heart isn't for death. Even in the Old Covenant, if you look at Ezekiel 18.23, <laughs> Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? Ezekiel 18.32, For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. 
Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? He doesn't even want the wicked to die. And he said that under the old covenant, and we have a better covenant established on better promises. That's Hebrews 8, 6. But here's, here's some scriptures just to give you an idea of God's heart on the matter. Psalms 103, 2 through 3. You guys will know this one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all. Everybody say all. All, all your diseases. Psalms 41, 2 through 3. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. And one of my favorites, and you guys know this one as well, John, uh, 3 John 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Be in good health. That word for health there means literally to be healthy, sound, and physically well. Sorry, it happens to me too. And that's God's heart for us, that we be healthy, sound, both mentally and physically, and that we be physically well. That is God's heart. That is God's heart. And healing, like I mentioned before, healing belongs to every believer, and it's actually part of the new covenant. Sickness had permission to be in our bodies due to the sin issue of fallen man. And now that the sin issue has been dealt with at the cross, so has sickness. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter 2.24 Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Notice that when Peter quoted Isaiah, he used past tense, you were healed. Isaiah used present tense, you are healed. And why? Because Isaiah was prophesying the future in Jesus' crucifixion. And Peter was speaking after Jesus had already risen from the dead. You were healed because the provision for your and my healing was made at the cross over 2,000 years ago. It's already been made. It's already been bought and paid for. And now all we do is we appropriate it into our bodies through understanding that truth and believing it. It's really no different than the belief it required to be saved. It's the same faith. It's the same faith. Sickness has no permission to be in your bodies now. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that our body is the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. Okay? Sickness can't reside in God's temple. So we need to maintain that mindset. It doesn't mean the enemy can't attack your health because he does. Remember, he comes to try to kill and steal and destroy. But it has no permission to be there. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And remember, as he is, so are we in this world. There's no sickness in heaven. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father right now and lives through us in the Holy Spirit in our own bodies. But there is no sickness in heaven. So as he is in heaven, so are we in this world. <coughs> that is why do we not receive that? Because we don't maintain that mindset. We don't maintain, and I'm as guilty as anyone else. I don't continually remind myself uh, as often as I should. And it's like a boxer letting his guard down. You're going to get hit if you don't keep your guard up. And so we have to maintain that mindset. You know what? As he is, so am I in this world. To quote our founder again, we need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. We really do. You have to get to a point where you're just tired of it. Uh, and not only in your life, not only in your health, but the, the life and health of other people around you. And here's how good God is. You don't even have to be saved. The person doesn't even have to be saved to be healed. There's many people that get saved after they're healed. 
Travis, why is that? Because the goodness of the Lord brings a man into repentance. That word repentance is metanoia in the Greek, and it just means to change your mind or think differently now. And so the goodness of God, if you see someone in a wheelchair and you go and pray for them and they get up and walk, and you say, Jesus did that, I didn't do that. Well, who's Jesus? This guy just got me out of a wheelchair. I want to meet this guy. Or a tumor falls off. Who did that? Jesus? I want to meet this guy. So it leads to salvation. You know, miracles prove God's existence. It really does. And that's why they're so important as believers. We need to be operating in the gifts and, and performing, not performing like it's us doing it, but we need to be channels to funnel God's healing power and his miracles to this planet, to these people. You know, signs and wonders following. You may be wondering why I'm kind of belaboring this point, but if you really want to get serious about praying for the sick and seeking opportunities for it, um, you have to know that th this is one of the common ploys that the enemy uses. This is typically how he comes against people is just flat out either God doesn't do it anymore, <coughs> you don't deserve it, you've done something wrong. There's just all these disqualifications that the enemy tries to bring in. Um, in my mind, the enemy is a lot like an American used car salesman. He is lying to you anytime he's talking to you. Okay. <laughs> That's good to know. I guess I won't be buying a used car on my way home. Uh, but you know, the enemy doesn't want people healed, friends. He wants us living sick, broken, and defeated lives. Doesn't want us living in freedom. And so it's up to you and I to know the truth and then spread that truth. Jesus said it's the truth you know that sets you free. We need to have an unwavering belief in healing and impart that belief to others. So let's talk about some practical points for praying for the sick. And again, these are things that God had just kind of brought on, put on my heart for you guys. Um, you know, we have an excellent healing curriculum at our school, and, and instead of just going in and copying and pasting everything they talk about, I just, Lord, what do you, what do you want to communicate to these people? And so the first thing the Lord really... Uh, put on my heart is you're a minister of God and you need to see yourself that way. You really do. Um, you don't have to be in full-time ministry to be a minister of God. The moment you say yes to Jesus, you're a minister. And you take kingdom healing wherever you go. It's in you. I just really want to encourage you guys with that. You know, if some of you are doubting your ability to pray for someone's healing, and that's normal, it's natural if you haven't done it before, let me, let me tell you what Jesus said. Let's turn to Mark 16. Verse 17. Mark 16, 17. While you're turning, I'm going to share a little something. We have one of our instructors who, he's a, I call him Reverend. He's a, uh, he was a pastor many years ago, and uh, he used to, he told on himself. He said he would tell his congregation, well, let's turn over to the book of Hezekiah. And he'd wait and listen and hear all the pages flipping. <laughs> And they wouldn't catch on that there is no book of Hezekiah. I won't do that to you, I promise. So Mark 16, verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick... And they will recover. Amen. Notice Jesus says these signs, also translated miracles, will follow those who believe. He didn't say those apostles who believe. Come on. Those disciples who believe. Those super apostles who believe. <coughs> those 11 of you. He was speaking to 11 of the disciples around the table. He didn't say those 11 of you around, these, uh, around this table. He said those who believe. The Greek word for believe there is pistuo. And according to Vine, uh, Vine's Greek expository, it means to believe, be persuaded of, and hence to place confidence in and trust in, reliance upon and not mere credence. This is describing a believer. Are you guys believers? Yes. Amen. Then this scripture applies to you. And these signs will follow you to include laying hands on the sick and they recover. The enemy doesn't want you to know that. He does not want you to know that. He doesn't want you operating in that. He wants you to believe that it's too good to be true so you won't step out in faith and pray for other people. He doesn't want you administering healing. Let's look at what Jesus said in John 14, 12. 
Go ahead and turn to John 14, 12, if you would. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, and that's the same Greek word, pistuo, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. He will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Did Jesus heal the sick? Yes. How did he do this? Yes, yes. he did. <clears throat> All that came to him were healed. All that came to him were healed. And notice the only qualifier. He who believes in me. That's it. He who believes in me. Belief in Jesus. That's it. And not, notice also he said that not only we're going to do the works that he did, we're going to do greater works. That's, uh, that's amazing. Second point is be compassionate. Be compassionate. Let's look at a few scriptures here. You know, Jesus was moved and motivated by compassion. So we, we need to as well. Uh, Matthew 9, 35. Matthew 9, 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Matthew 14, 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and healed their sick. Matthew 20, verse 32. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes might be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Luke 7, verse 13. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him back to his mother. So we see in these verses how compassion affected the Lord, and he acted on that compassion. We know that to be, you know, we are to be conformed to the image of the Son, Jesus. So we should have compassion on those that are suffering and pray for them as well. And here, here's an important caveat, however. Um, there is so much need for healing out there that you really need to filter it through the Holy Spirit. Uh, you don't want to burn yourself out trying to meet all that need. Our, our founder, um, he realized when he would go to his uh, conventions and it was just him and starting out, he would have a prayer line out the door, people wanting prayer, and he would be up till 3 o'clock in the morning praying for people. And then... He'd have to go get a couple hours of sleep and get up and do it, do it again the next day and he was wearing himself out. And so there is so much need out there. Your compassion really needs to be filtered through the Holy Spirit. Um, you can't pray for everyone. Okay? And the Lord isn't calling you to. You pray for those the Lord puts in your path and on your heart through His leading. And don't overextend yourself. It's not a flesh thing. Okay? And I'm guilty of this. I'm, letting, uh, I'm guilty of letting the, the overwhelming need at times dictate who I pray for and how long and what happens is you just, you burn out. It becomes a fleshly thing. Um, it's not that God doesn't still work, but you become uh, worn out in your own flesh. And, and if you do that too long, too often, it can actually start affecting your health as well. So just filter that through the Holy Spirit and be led by Him. Amen? Third point. Be bold, not fearful. It's important to not let fear limit us when we're praying for others. Fear about what if they don't get healed? What if I'm not saying the magic words? What does it sound like, you know? Um, fear what people might think if the Lord puts a stranger on our heart and we go up to him and say, you know, my name is Travis, can I pray for you? You know, that, that fear of being rejected, if they say no, you know. Um, first of all, there are no magic words. 
You know, it's just God's word and his truth. And remember, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7. And the righteous are bold as a lion. Proverbs 28.1. Are you righteous? Yes. You said yes to Jesus, you are. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you said yes to Jesus, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. And that righteousness was a gift, Romans 5.17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Righteousness isn't a behavior to perform, and that's how a lot of American churches have taught it. You gotta be righteous, you gotta be righteous. And then some rock groups came along in the 70s and everything was righteous. Um, it's not a behavior to perform, it's our new identity in Christ. And so when you understand your right standing with God, you will be bold. Why is it important that we know we're righteous in regards to healing? Because James 5.16 tells us that the prayers, the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. They're very effective. And so you guys need to understand that you are righteous with God. You have right standing with God. By saying yes to Jesus, you have right standing with God. And also, we don't fear man because the word tells us that it's a snare in Proverbs. And we don't fear their diagnosis, and this is important. This is really important. We don't fear their diagnosis when we're praying for them either. Whatever its name is, whether it's cancer, AIDS, HIV, COPD, his name is above every name. And so every disease and sickness has to submit to his authority and be healed. That's really the truth. When we magnify a person's condition, what it can do is cause them to lose hope in God's power to heal them. And their faith to receive. And it's not that we're pretending that the condition doesn't exist. We just don't want to put it on a throne above or even next to Jesus. It doesn't belong there. We just confidently assure them that there's nothing Jesus can't heal them from. Because it's the truth. There's nothing he can't heal them from. You know, what's really interesting about the Bible College. There's several people. We have several healing journey testimonies on our, on our website uh, the ministry website, and some of them are students, and there's some that have been healed from some of the very things I'm telling you about. There was a student who was a year ahead of me. She was from Uganda. Her husband was from the, the state of Washington, which is just north of my home state. She was healed of AIDS. Not HIV, AIDS. And there are several students that were my classmates, either in my class, a year ahead of me, after, uh, before me, um, who were healed of cancer. Um, one had a, a major stroke, and the doctor said he'd never be able to walk. And he was a classmate of mine. Walking and talking. He had a little, you know, remnant of, of the effects of the stroke, but it was a severe stroke. And it's on the healing journey testimony. The doctor that looked at his brain scan said, it's, you shouldn't be able to do this. I don't know how you're able to do this. So we don't want to magnify their condition. There's just nothing that is too big for God to heal. Right. Amen. Point number four. Know what the word says about healing. And this is important. Speak it. Knowing God's word will, will refute any unbelief and it will give the sick person confidence in God's ability to heal them. Our job is just to speak God's word and then point them to Jesus. Remember, Jesus is the healer. In the last half of John 6, 63, Jesus says... The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. There's actually life in God's word. God's word has life in it. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is living and powerful or active. When you speak God's word over them and encourage them to do the same, to speak that word over themselves, there is living, powerful, active life going into their situation. Romans 4.17, Paul reminds us that God gives life to the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. That's why we can encourage someone who is facing a life or death situation, whether it's kidney failure, 
whether it's uh, pancreatic cancer, whether it's lung disease, whatever it is, God says they're healed. He calls those things as be not as though they were. We can speak life to someone regardless of the severity of their diagnosis. Why am I putting an emphasis on what we speak? Because Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. So we always want to speak life. Life to the person. Death to whatever they're, they're dealing with in their body. Mark 11.23. Jesus says, For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. So remember that scripture too when you're speaking into someone's life. You're speaking to the condition in their body and you're praying for their healing. You will have whatever you say. So we always want to speak God's life-giving word and not what the doctor's reports say. <laughs> We don't want to speak life to the problem and give it power. We just don't want to do that. The doctor's reports are always temporal. And temporal things change. God's word is eternal. So that's where we need to put our focus on. We don't want to magnify the doctor's report. Again, we're not pretending it's not real. I understand you have a tumor in your body. I understand you're going through kidney failure. I understand. But here's the truth of God's word. It's one of my favorite scriptures. You know, it really, his word literally um, destroys the power of the enemy in our lives. Jeremiah 23, 29. God says, is my word not like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? One interesting thing here is that the Hebrew word for rock is selah. And it not only means rock, but also fortress or stronghold. A stronghold in a believer's life is a, a lie believed about themselves. You're ugly. You're stupid. You'll never amount to anything. Events that have happened to them, you know, the lies they believe about things that have happened to them, whether they blame God for it um, or it was something they did and they're just believing these lies. As, and lies just about God and who he is, his, his very nature, his, his culture of healing and how, you know, he doesn't do that anymore. Remember 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, pulling down those lies, casting down arguments, which means computations, reasonings, imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The Word is one of our greatest weapons. has a phone center where people call from all over the globe and they can call in and receive prayer and there are testimonies daily of people getting healed and delivered from all kinds of diseases, all kinds of issues. Um, we get them daily. We get the testimonies daily. You say, Travis, well, how can that happen? Psalms 107.20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. It's the word. He sent the word and it healed them and delivered them from their destructions. When I was a first-year student, I was sitting in uh, class, and uh, the gentleman I actually work for now, Barry Bennett, excellent, well-respected instructor, he was actually teaching on that very thing. He was teaching on healing. And I had pulled a muscle in my back from working out. I know I look like I just eat out, but I, I get, we walk by faith, you know, not by sight. I still work out. And so I pulled a muscle in between my shoulder blades, and I was, I was in pain, and I'm sitting in class, and I'm just listening to the word, and I'm a first-year student. I don't, I'm just sitting there learning. I'm not expecting anything to happen. And the muscle just releases right in the middle of class. It just, the pain just goes away. And so I had to go up and share that with him and say, hey, while you were teaching, the Word just healed my back. I wasn't doing anything. I was sitting there, you know, listening, and the Word just healed it. I was fine. I 
I've got a couple more of uh, testimonies later on about uh, praying for people over the phone. It was my mother, but uh, some amazing things God did. Um, point number five, and this, this is huge for me. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when you're praying for someone. This is really important. We want the Holy Spirit's wisdom when we pray for someone and not just what our natural eyes see and the symptoms tell us because often the issue is deeper. You know, you think about this. If something's wrong with your car, who would you rather have diagnose and repair it? A mechanic with general training, but not on your specific brand? Or someone who has had factory training by the manufacturer of your car? Who understands how and why it was designed down to every nut and bolt? Who understands its engineering intricacies and idiosyncrasies? And has the ability to plug into factory diagnostic equipment designed for your car by the manufacturer. So it's the latter one, correct? Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit is our factory trained technician. He understands how and why our bodies were designed, the intricacies and idiosyncrasies of our bodies, and he is that factory diagnostic equipment designed for us by the manufacturer, God. John 16, 13 tells us that he is the spirit of truth. And he will guide us into all truth. This includes the truth about what's going on in someone's health, whether it's your own or someone else you're praying for. James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. And so this includes wisdom and what's going on in a person's health as well despite what the symptoms may indicate. Um, there's an employee. He's actually not an employee any longer. His wife still is an employee with the ministry. His name's Damon. And this, this healing journey testimony can be found on our website. And so when their son, Jason, was born, um, he had really bad eczema on his face. Really bad eczema. If you guys know what the red condition, skin condition is, eczema, it itches really bad. And so as Jason got older, it was getting really bad. And when they'd go out in public, people would say, what's wrong? Why did you leave your baby out in the sun? Why is he sunburned? It would itch so bad that he would rub his face on the carpet because he wasn't allowed to scratch it with his fingers, and there would be blood all over the carpet. The mother, um, you know, as most mothers do, will let the baby cry themselves to sleep. And so one time, as per her normal practice, she was letting Jason cry himself to sleep, went to check on him, and he'd fallen asleep in a pool of his own blood, just from scratching his face. That's how bad this eczema was getting. And so they were trying not to get into works. They knew that the healing had already been provided for in the spirit realm. They already knew it was there. And so, but they had tried, you know, everybody wants to help. Hey, have you tried this? Hey, have you tried rubbing potatoes on? You know, everybody would come up with some crazy thing that their grandmother told them. And they were trying ointments, and they were trying medicines, and nothing was working. And so you look at the surface, and it says, there's a skin issue, pray for the skin. And so they're praying, they're not seeing any change. And so one day, his children are playing in the driveway, and the Holy Spirit speaks to him. And he just started praying in tongues for his son, and uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, pray for his heart. Not his skin like the natural eyes say. Not his skin like the doctors thought. Not a skin like all the self-professed medical diagnostic team out in the public. Pray for his heart. And so Damon prayed for his heart, commanded it to operate like God designed it. Then a week he was completely healed. So that's why it's so important that the Holy Spirit's wisdom. And really, guys, as believers, we need to be operating out of the wisdom and the leading of the Holy Spirit at all times. We really do. It's so, it's so crucial. But it becomes really important in healing because our natural eyes might see what, what we think is wrong. And we pray for that, and we might not see results. So we always want to have his wisdom. <coughs> you know, sometimes I'll pray in tongues silently for a minute or two for whoever I'm praying for before I actually start praying over the issue, just to kind of get God's wisdom on it. Sometimes I'll just get a prompting, like, you know, it's, it just originates in here, and it's just kind of like, pray in this direction. And so I just follow that leading. Um, you know, if this sounds foreign to you or intimidating, I just encourage you to step out in faith and do it and watch God respond. Um, and this isn't to say we don't ask them, you know, what the health problem is that they're struggling with when they come up for prayer. 
Because we do. You know, we want to know that. Uh, we just consult the Holy Spirit each time to get His wisdom. You know, in the natural world, to ensure a, di a diagnosis is accurate, at least in America, if, if you got a bad, diagnose, uh, bad diagnosis, um, you would go to another doctor to get a second opinion, just to make sure that diagnosis was valid. So the Holy Spirit is our second opinion. He is the expert opinion. Amen? He is never wrong. Number seven, don't be phased by their emotions. As I mentioned in point two, we want to be compassionate, but we want to guard against letting the person's emotions we're praying for affect or manipulate us. There are times when you pray for someone that their emotions, whether it's anger, bitterness, fear, hopelessness, can permeate the atmosphere. It can influence you too if you're not prepared for that. Especially if you have a real compassionate, sensitive heart. Um, it, it can really affect you and influence you. And so what happens is then you begin to sympathize with them, empathize with them. You see the problem through their eyes. And suddenly you're not going to pray with power and boldness like you need to. Suddenly you've taken on their perspective. It's like a drowning person pulling the lifeguard down with them. And they're both lost. And it can be difficult to get at times. And I'm, I'm speaking from experience here. I mean, problems that will just, you know, they come up to you and they're in tears. And to them, it is a red alert, live or die situation. And, and that is, you see it in their emotions. They're in tears. They're in fear. They're scared. And this is where the minister, remember I said you guys are all ministers of God. And so this is where compassion and ministry comes out. And you have to, you have to, the British are much better at this than the Americans. Americans were just kind of, emotional cannons ready to go off at any, any time. I think you guys are much better at, at maintaining um, peace um, in a situation like that. And so I think um, it'll come easier to you, but really uh, it becomes so difficult. I mean, it'll literally rip your heart out at times. Um, you know, it's almost like when, when they get in a situation like that, it's like, yeah, I understand the word of God, but now I'm really in trouble. Now I really need your help. And so what you have to do is, is remain calm Remain calm and remind them what the word says. And confidently pray over them without identifying with their situation and emotions. Once you're done, you do what it says in Acts 20, 32. So now, brethren, I commend you, which means place beside or set before. I set, bef I set you before God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So a testimony of my mom um, she's a self-proclaimed uh, she's a self-proclaimed klutz. And so what that means in America is you just you stumble over things easily, you fall down easily, you're just your balance isn't very good. And she laughs about it, but she had a situation a um, year and a half ago where she hit her head, and it, she hit it so hard it caused her to fall back on her back, and did some serious damage to her kidneys and one of her hands as she caught herself. And so she goes to the doctor and they tell her that she's gonna need a serious, serious kidney procedure. Mm. And so she calls me upset, despondent, understandably, you know, she's upset, she's despondent, and you could sense there was some hopelessness there. And there's times, friends, when I pray for people that, I don't get frustrated at the person, but I get frustrated at the attack on their body. And so I just reminded her of the word, and I prayed over her. It wasn't anything superfluous. I didn't use any magic words. There are no magic words. It's the word of God. Yeah. And so I prayed over her. And uh, she went back. She had a follow-up appointment with the doctor. And so she goes to the doctor. And she calls me all excited. And she said, the doctor's never seen anything like this. He said, it's a miracle. He said, I, she said, I don't need this procedure. My kidneys um, are healed. There's nothing wrong with that. And again, Psalms 10720. I didn't lay hands on her. I prayed over her over the phone. And so the next issue was her hand from the fall as well. And so she had really limited mobility. And she's out trying to mow her grass, pushing the lawnmower, and her hand hurts, and she has very limited mobility, and it's always in pain. It's like, okay, no problem. We're just going to pray over it. And because she doesn't live in the state I do, I can't lay hands on her, so I pray over her over the phone. And now she's got 100% mobility. And it's not me. It's not me, it's God. And so if I can do it, you can do it. 
And then there was one last, uh, she actually, this was last summer, um, she was suffering from arrhythmia in her heart. Her heart was not beating like it should. And um, she was told it was caused by an enlarged atrium in her heart. And so, what do we do? Has it come to this? We pray. <laughs> and so I prayed over her, and she, <laughs> the arrhythmia stopped. She went back to the doctor. The doctor told her that her heart was actually stronger and better than, than people her age. It was functioning better than people her age. And then there was one last thing that she had to do uh, with her health. And her faith was strong now. You, you start experiencing those things, and it builds your faith up. Build your faith up in God's ability to heal and to stand in faith for your healing. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but she went to the doctor and she actually started speaking it over herself. She went to the doctor and everything was fine. So remember when you're praying for people, they have the same God you do. You're not their God. Okay, we pray for them. We, we stand with them in faith. We encourage them. We point them to God's word. And we point them to Jesus. He is the healer. Um, my job as assistant dean of students has many facets. Um, I'm one part truancy officer, one part collections agent, one part hall monitor, one part deputy sheriff, and one part pastor. And I think that last one, that pastor qualification, wasn't something that they anticipated. My, my position was created in 2016, and um, <coughs> I've been serving in it since then. And so much of it is, is pastoral, and there's... The students get to know me, they see I'm approachable, and I have a pastor's heart, and so they'll come up to me and share things with me. And so I have an opportunity to pray almost daily. In fact, there's times I need to disguise to get from my office to the toilet because someone will stop me in the hall with some need. And I, I wish I was joking, but that's, that's just the, the world we live in and, and how intense the enemy's attacks can be at times, the frequency and intensity. And so I have to remind myself, too, that God is their source. I do my part, but then I commend them to his word and his grace. You know, it's, not, it's not up to me. Um, I was talking to this very subject about, about healing and, and the difficulty in dealing with the emotional ties we have for people that we're praying for. And uh, I was talking with the director of our Bible college, uh, Pastor Greg Moore, and he, he referenced both Galatians 6, 2, where Paul says to bear one another's burdens. And then in verse 5 he says, for each one shall bear his own load. Paul said that. And, and Pastor Greg was basically saying, you need the Holy Spirit to help you decide which one applies at that time. Because you can't carry everybody's burdens. You really can't. So only bear the burdens the Lord is calling you to and set everything else for him to handle. Don't carry things you're not supposed to and do not get, don't become um, worn out ministering to people. So now that we kind of had a foundation, what I'd like to do is, is just talk about how to pray for the sick. You know, just the actual prayer. As I mentioned before, there aren't any magic words. You know, there's no weird hand positions. If you've seen Star Trek, there's no live long and prosper. We don't run up and do this in front of them. You know, we speak the word in boldness and in faith. You know, Jesus doesn't walk in this, in this earth in physical form. He lives in and through us. And because he isn't here in physical form to rebuke sickness and disease, he needs us to do it on his behalf. Taking the authority he has given us. We use the authority God has given us to speak to the problem, command the pain and sickness and disease to go. If you look at Luke 10, uh, verse 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And this applies to our own bodies as well. We have the authority over our own flesh. And it must come under submission to God's word. Just like in another person's life, it has to come under submission to God's word. Don't accept, don't accept sickness in your body or anyone else's. Just don't accept it. There's times I have to speak to my body. Like I mentioned, I've been going through, uh, I got attacked in insomnia. Even this morning, I'm speaking the word over myself. And so even if you don't see immediate change, friends, it doesn't mean we change our policy or procedure. Sometimes people are delivered instantly when we pray for them, and sometimes it's a, it's a walking out their healing. It, it, it just comes in, in steps. And so we, we remain resilient, dedicated to the Word, and we trust God through it. 
And so um, it's his power that I'm up here and semi-conscious right now after <laughs> not sleeping for very long. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, some people think they have to feel a certain way before they pray for somebody. I've got to feel it, brother. Americans are like, oh, i got to feel i got the power. i got to feel it. Like lightning bolts are going to come out of their fingers or something. I don't, I don't know why they do that, but um, they, they feel like if, if they don't feel it, it's not going to work. You know, if I pray for someone, I don't feel it, it's not going to work. Um, that's not true. You don't have to feel it. You don't have to feel some special anointing or, or some special power. Um, <laughs> they don't, neither do you. It's God's, it's God's power that heals in his word that heals, and all you have to do is speak it in this realm. Um, one of my previous positions with the ministry, um, I served four years in their security department. And so I'm going to tell on myself a little bit here. I was a second year student, and um, I was on duty one evening, and we have a policy that people that come to night school, they can't visit after uh, 7 p.m., 1,900 hours. And so the enemy had really been hitting us. Boy, it, you know, I'd never been attacked so much in my life until I decided to step out and, and go to Bible college. Mm -hmm. But again, the rewards, um, you, you can't... You can't put a price on, on being faithful to God and how he will bless you in the process. So anyway, I'm on duty one night, and I'm just in my flesh, guys. I, I'm just, I'm pity party table one. You know, I'm just really in my flesh, whiny, crybaby, and I'm on duty, and I see this, this older couple come up. I was like, oh, I don't want to go out and talk to them. Ugh. So I go out and talk to them, and they had just driven up from the state of Texas. And... Uh, I started talking to them and I explained that, you know, they couldn't come in and visit night school and I encouraged them to stay for healing school. We have healing school every Thursday from 1 to 3 p.m. Mountain Time. So you guys could even tune in, um, you know, on the internet. And we live streamed it. So I'm encouraging them to stay for healing school and I could tell the wife wanted to go back to Texas. And then he came out and said, well, she doesn't want to stay, but I do. And this was on a Tuesday and I was encouraging them to stay until Thursday. And so, for whatever reason, and this, I, some elderly people in America, for whatever reason, they will just tell you everything that's wrong with their body. I have my, my paternal grandmother was like that sweet lady, amazing woman of God, um, lived to be 98. But every time I'd see her, Grandma, how are you? Oh, well, you know, this isn't working, and that isn't working, and that isn't working, and this isn't working, and this stopped working, and that started and then stopped again. And so that's what happened with Rod. So I'm talking, to, he just all of a sudden just starts telling me everything that's wrong with his body. Well, you know, I got this, and I got that, and I got this, and I got that. And I'm like, ah. I don't, I don't have this facial expression. I maintain, you know, a little bit of professionalism. But he's telling me everything that's wrong with him. I'm like, oh, Lord. And I feel the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit goes, pray for him. I'm thinking, Lord, we have the phone center for that. <laughs> you call the phone center. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit wouldn't leave me alone. It wasn't a, a solid punch in the stomach like you need to pray for him. It was just this gentle leading. You need to pray for him. I said, fine. And I said, well, let me pray for you. And we had just had a minister. It's the first time I'd heard of him before uh, by the name of Cecil Paxton. He's got an international ministry of healing. And some of you might know who I'm talking about. Um, really operates in the, in the gift of healing great guy and we had just had him that day it's the first time i'd ever heard him he was teaching in our bible college and he said when he prays for someone and this is just how he does it there's nothing wrong with the other way but he said when he prays for somebody like if it's a knee issue he doesn't pray for the knee he releases the life of christ into it and so here's rod telling me everything that's wrong and i'm like no, i just had cecil today doesn't hurt i'll just release the life of christ into it i guess and so I said, well, let me pray for you. So I put one hand on his back, I put one hand on his stomach, and I just prayed for him, prayed the word over him, released the life of Christ into his stomach. He didn't jump up and down. There was no immediate reaction like, praise hallelujah, I'm healed. Thank you, Jesus. We got done. I encouraged him to stay for healing school till Thursday. They left. I turn around, I go in the building, I feel like a million dollars. I didn't see anything happen. I don't... You know, that's sometimes things happen in the spirit realm and, and you don't know why it changes. You're, it was like something was lifted off or broken off of me. I was going in the building praising God. I went out 
a curmudgeon, and I went in praising the Lord for the opportunity to minister, just to pray for someone to be used. And so a couple weeks later, um, because of my shift, I, I would work in the evenings, and we had a certain protocol for closing the building, and so we would park at the back of the building, walk through our communication services, our phone center where people call in to get prayer for healing. And so I'd walk through there on my way to the security office. And so I'm going through one day, and this was maybe a week after I prayed for Rod. And one of my friends says, hey, so-and-so is looking for you. I said, okay. So I would try to, every time I would go to her desk, she wouldn't be there. And she'd come by the security office, and I wasn't there. I'd be out doing something. So another week went by, and we finally caught up. And she said, you know, I got this call from this guy the other day. And he called, and he was complaining because he stayed for healing school, and he wanted this person to teach, and this person taught, and he wasn't happy about that. But he said the night security guard prayed for him and God healed him of a major stomach issue he'd had for years. The first cool thing about that was he realized it wasn't me. It was God. God healed him. I didn't feel anything other than the, that, that frustration and anger and upset that I felt. That was, the, that, that was the only indicator I had that something might have happened. You know, that was lifted off of me. But I didn't, there was no reaction in his flesh when I prayed for him. He left our building, went back to his hotel, which may be less than 10 minutes away, and God healed him of a major stomach issue. I didn't even feel like praying, guys. I was in my flesh. I didn't want to do it. It's like, call the phone center. I'm security. See this? This is what it says on my shirt. But God did it anyway. And so there aren't any magic words. It's the Lord who heals. All I did was I spoke the word over him. I prayed for him. My faith was a little questionable at the time. Just going to say, I'm being honest. And God healed him of a major stomach issue that he'd had for years. That's just amazing to me. So I want to talk about different types of prayer. James, would you come up for a minute? This handsome, strapping young man is James. So again, when I'm praying for someone... You know, I always try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I always want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, okay? And I always use the name of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said in Mark 16, in my name. Yes. Okay, so I always use the word, the name of Jesus, okay? But sometimes if I'm praying for someone, I'll do like Cecil had taught me, and I've had much success with it. Again, there's not magic words, but you just go how the Lord leads you. And so sometimes I'll pray for someone. Release the life of Christ in so and so's body and speak to his organs. Whatever's wrong, I speak to his heart. Whatever the issue may be, I'll release the life of Christ into it. Sometimes um, I'll speak to the problem itself if it's something specific. Like with my mother, I speak to the, if I knew it was the aorta, I could speak to the aorta. Lord, I speak to the aorta. I command it to be uh, proper size. If it's inflamed, I command that, I command that to come down now in the name of Jesus. I command that swelling to come down. I command that aorta to return to its normal size. And I speak to it directly. Um, sometimes I might speak to the problem and command restoration. If it's a knee, if it's the back, if they tell me it's C7 or L5 and they've got, they've got an issue in their cartilage, I'll speak to their back. I command that cartilage to return in the name of Jesus. I command it now, right now, in the name of Jesus to return, to fill up the, that, that section between the bones. Or if it's a knee, I command the cartilage to return to the knee. There's many testimonies, friends, of people not only having that type of thing happen, but actually new organs, new organs return to their bodies. Sometimes they'll just come in agreement with a prayer they've already received, or I'll just praise God for their healing. Lord, I praise you that so-and-so is healed and delivered from this. I thank you. I stand in agreement with them. Where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are also. And I just praise you that they are healed. They are delivered from this. This is not going to take them out. This is not going to take their life. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Thank you, Lord. They are delivered. Thank you, Lord. They are healed. Many times I'll lay, lay hands on that specific area. You know, I'll lay hands if it's a shoulder, if it's a knee, if it's the back. And this is just how I do it. You always want to be led by the Holy Spirit. 
You know, the Lord, again, the Lord might give you a word. You, you might think, well, they, they're complaining about their abdomen. Okay, so common sense says, well, let's pray for their abdomen. But again, the Holy Spirit might say, no, it actually originates in the kidneys. So you put your hand on the kidneys. Lord, I speak health to their kidneys. I have a friend who's very prophetic. Um, and he came to me the other day, and, and they were, he and his wife were coming back for lunch. And his wife works for the ministry. And he came into my office. He knew I'd been struggling with insomnia. And um, he said, the Lord put it on my heart to pray for your liver. I said, I don't know why. I'm just here to pray for your liver. I'm like, hallelujah, brother. Pray on. I receive it. Whatever you got, I take it. If it's from God, I take it. You know, I don't really think it's a problem um, for men to pray for women or women to pray for men. You just want to use wisdom. You always want to avoid the appearance of evil. So you don't want to do it in a real secluded room where it might cause people to think something strange might be happening. And I will also add that you just want to be mindful of where you put your hands. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Just be mindful of hand placement when you're laying hands on someone. There's some areas that wisdom will tell you shouldn't shouldn't touch. It's always a good idea, too, if it's a stranger or somebody that doesn't come to you for prayer. Sir, if you don't mind, I'd like to place my hand on your shoulder and pray for your shoulder. Is that okay? Fantastic. Lord, thank you for healing his shoulder. And so I'll ask permission first, because some people, you know, Americans, they can be very different. Some have very small bubbles, and they're, ah, and some are like, stay away from me. And so if you get a sense from the Holy Spirit that it's stay away from me, stay away from it. Yeah. You know, but ask permission first. Um, once you prayed for him, like if, if James had a knee issue and I prayed for him, <coughs> what you can do is carefully... Try to do something you couldn't do before. Carefully try to bend it. And if they try to bend it, well, it's better. Is it 100%? No. Okay, we're going to pray again. Thank you, Jesus, that this is completely healed. So we pray once, and it's done. And so beyond that, we just thank God that it's healed. We stand in agreement with it that it's healed. We want them to understand that it's healed too. It doesn't take 40,000 prayers. Well, you know what? 41,000 prayers and it'll be healed and you'll get a free set of steak knives. No. You pray once, believe it's healed, it's healed, and then thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's 70% now. I'm believing it's going to be 100%. Try it again. Okay, great. We're at 80%. Praise the Lord. Lord, thank you that we're at 80%. We want 100%. You put a demand on the Lord's grace. You hold him to it. He wants to be stretched that way. He wants us to take from him. He wants us to take from him. You know, if it's, a, if it's uh, a demonic situation, you just rebuke the spirit and command it to come out. I haven't experienced that yet, praise God, but I look forward to the opportunity at the same time. I'm not afraid. Um, you don't be scared. You're not intimidated. Remember, we don't have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we just do like Jesus did and rebuke it and cast it out. You also don't have to yell. Thank you, James. You don't have to yell. And this is more for Americans than British. But uh, you don't have to yell. You don't even have to raise your voice. And I, it's pick on Americans Day. I'm going to tell on this again. So I don't know why Americans do this. But when they travel to a foreign country that doesn't speak English, many will not even take a minute to learn a few words. Every time I go on a mission trip to a foreign culture, I love to learn the language. It shows them respect. And when you do that, it opens doors for ministry. If I come in ethnocentric and think my, my culture is better than yours, you're not going to want to receive from me. But I come in with humility and show you that I'm humble and, hey, I've taken the time to learn a little, a little bit of your language. Um, it, it allows you to minister to them. It opens up their heart. And so what Americans do, they don't do that. They'll go to a foreign country, and they'll talk to the person that doesn't speak their language like they do. Excuse me, where's the toilet? <laughs> and they'll get a blank stare. And so instead of rephrasing the question in their own language or trying to, trying to bridge that gap of communication, they'll just talk louder and add an O to the end of it. I said O, where O is the toilet O? Like raising your voice and adding an O. Oh, why didn't you say toilet O? So obvious. You should have said that to begin with. So you don't have to raise your voice unless the Lord leads you to be bold and just cast it out. Again, we always follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But you don't have to yell. You don't have to speak loud. Um, if you're speaking to a group, maybe you're leading a Bible study or teaching, or even if I was up here, the Lord might put it on my heart. You know, the Lord has put it on my heart that someone has been struggling with a heart condition. If that's you, would you raise your hand? 
And so they'll raise your hand. All right. I speak to your heart right now in the name of Jesus. I command that your heart is as strong as a 25-year-old. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we stand in agreement for the health and the strength in his heart of a 25-year-old. And we stand in agreement that he is receiving that right now in the name of Jesus. You don't have a heart problem in heaven. He doesn't have a heart problem in this realm. We thank you, Lord, that he is healed. We stand in agreement. We rejoice in his health. In Jesus' name, amen. And so there may be times that you, and that's a, that's a legitimate prayer, brother. You receive that. And there may be times where we do that, where the Lord just puts something, an unction on your spirit, where you start calling out something. Just like that. And, and someone will raise their hand and you say, praise the Lord. Let's pray. And so you can do it corporately. If the person's kind of shy, they kind of do this. You can try to catch them after the service or after the Bible study. But there definitely could be times that the Lord will lead, uh, lead you to do that. Um, if it's a stranger. James, one more time, please. If it's a stranger, I'm going to ask permission to pray for him. Okay, so for this demonstration, you're just going to say no. Hello, sir. You know, the Lord really put it on my heart that, that I need to pray for you. My name is Travis, and this sense from the Lord that you need some healing, and I, I would love to pray with you if that's okay. Can I pray for you? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Not a problem, sir. I, I respect that. Thank you for your time. Let's see. Can I still pray for him? Yes. Absolutely. Watch. What I do is I step behind the Cadbury chocolates and the Christmas pudding, and I become a Holy Spirit archer. Lord, thank you for that man's healing. Whatever condition you put on my heart to pray for him, I release the life of Christ in his body. I speak that it is restored. I speak the enemy has no place in his life, and he is completely healed in the name of Jesus. And then I go about my business, and he's, he's no, he's no uh, wiser. And then he goes home and he's healed. And it's like, how did that happen? Man, I went to the grocery and I was healed. It must have been that lemon juice I bought. <laughs> I have no idea. You may need to, this is, a, this is one that I come to occasionally as well. You may need to minister to somebody before you actually pray for their healing. It could be a, a bitterness. Uh, root of bitterness causes a lot of issues in the body. A lot of physical issues. And so you might need to minister to them on bitter, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is another, another big one. Um, because these cause issues in the body, it can inhibit them from receiving their healing. So this is where you put your pastor hat on. Remember, you're all ministers. And so once this is discovered, you lead them in prayer to deal with those issues first and then move on to pray for their physical healing. Um, the healing will often manifest quicker and easier now. Remember Jeremiah 20, uh, 23, 29? Is not my word like a fire and like a hammer that crushes a rock to pieces? And so that rock is a stronghold. And so these people, they're bitter, they're angry, they're upset because of a stronghold inside of them. And so we deal with that. We address that. We remove that. Um, I was watching the testimony of a, a famous pastor. And he had that same thing happen where he went up to this lady and, and she needed prayer for healing. And he just sent from the Lord. Are you struggling with bitterness? And the lady, like a, most Americans, well, yeah. And so she just opened up and he prayed for her and, and uh, removed that off of her. And uh, she was healed. She received her healing. And so an important thing to communicate to him, too, when you're forgiving someone, it's not saying what the other person did to them was right. A lot of times people will not give forgiveness because if, if they do, they feel like they're giving. It's like saying the other person and what they did to them was okay. And some people have had some awful things happen to them, myself included, by other people. But that doesn't stop us from forgiving them. What it does is it removes our tie to the situation and gives God the ability to come in and do what only he can do. Okay? Sharing healing testimonies before you pray is always good. What it does is it creates an environment for healing. Um, Rod, the gentleman I was telling you about that healed his stomach, God healed his stomach, so I'm walking through, making my rounds one evening, and I go into our phone center where the, the healing uh, phone lines are, and um, one of my friends works behind the desk in there, and uh, she had a, a brace on her hand. So I said, hey, what, you know, what's going on there? She said, well, I have carpal tunnel. I said, oh, okay. And then this, this was, Rod was kind of like the demarcation point for God really using me to heal people. I mean, I prayed for people before and had them, had God do some things in their life, but Rod was really kind of the demarcation point for 
God doing something serious and miraculous. And so I said, well, not a problem. Let me tell you what God did with Rod. And here's what I did. And it wasn't me, it was God. And here's what happened. She's like, oh, cool. So I put my hand on her, on her brace and I prayed for her. The very next day I'm in the break room and I'm standing there talking to someone and I see somebody in my peripheral vision doing this. <laughs> and finally I turn and it's this individual. And she's doing this. I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> my hand, it's not in the brace. God healed it. And it was because hearing the testimony and seeing someone healed at our ministry built her faith and helped her receive her healing. And so I carried that on one more time. I'm making my rounds through the same uh, comm services, is what we call it, communication services. And uh, one of the other, uh, there's another employee that was uh, in there, and she had a back issue. And I said, well, praise God. Look, here's what God did with Rod, and here's what God did with the other employee in the ministry here. Let me pray for you. And I prayed for her, and God healed her back. And so testimonies are always good. They're always good to build that environment of faith to help receive. It just really helps that person. It gives them confidence that God is real, He does heal, and they can receive it in their own bodies. And that's really crucial. The, the, the person that you're praying for really needs to know that God wants to heal them and He can heal them. And He will heal them. Um, just a few other notes here. Don't feel nervous if a tumor falls off while you're praying. It's happened before. <laughs> Um, you may have the person you're praying for tell you that you f they feel heat coming from your hands when you're praying for them. Um, I've had people tell me that before. Sometimes when I pray for them, it's like, ooh, I, you know, your hand was hot on my knee. I can feel heat coming out. And what's interesting is my hands are typically cold. Cold hands, warm heart. So if you have heat come out of, out of your hands, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you if people tell you that. And conversely, if you don't have heat coming out of your hands when you pray for someone, it doesn't mean anything. God's still healing. And so that's one of those things we're really not sure. Some people really believe it's just a stronger anointing for healing when you pray for someone that heat comes out of your hands. But irrespective, the healing still flows. You speak the word, put your hands on them and heal them. Okay? So that, that, that doesn't determine whether they're going to get healed or not. <coughs> um, you may be thinking, Travis, there will be times I pray for someone and they never receive their healing. Yeah, to be honest. Yes, there will be. But the way I see it, I'm planting a seed of faith for their healing when I pray for them. Amen. This is my own personal belief. You know, Paul said that he planted and Apollos watered, but who caused the increase? God. Yeah, God caused the increase. <laughs> will there be times that I pray for someone who is dying and they die anyway? Unfortunately, yes, again. But you can't let that deter you from praying for the next person. We know it's God's will to heal every time. He's the healer and we are just his mouthpiece in this realm. Exercising his authority to accomplish his will. We never take the credit when they get healed and we never take the blame when they don't. Yes. Once you've prayed for them and they're healed, encourage them to stand on the word and the fact that they were healed regardless of if it's manifested in their body yet. I'm going to have to pick up here real quick uh, just because of time. You know, encourage them not to identify with the sickness or disease any longer. They need to believe they were healed and stand on that, even if the symptoms persist. This becomes especially true once their healing has manifested, as the enemy will often bring in false symptoms to convince a person they weren't really healed. Oh no, the pain is back. Oh no, the swelling is back. Oh no, this symptom or that symptom's back. This is one of Satan's most common ploys to get people to come in agreement with they weren't healed. Why? Because if he can get, it, if he can get that to happen, um, that lie that they weren't healed, it gives the problem power, power and permission to return. Remember, we receive what we believe. This is where they need to stand on God's word for themselves, quote scripture, and rebuke the lying symptoms. Remember, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Don't, don't be... Don't be... Uh, someone he can devour. I'll just end with this. This is kind of a public service announcement. You know, and I really feel like it's important to end with this. Most of us are not doctors or licensed counselors, so we don't, we don't make medical diagnoses, okay? And we don't recommend someone goes off their medication as an act of faith. Yeah. Okay, this is important. 
That is something they need to hear from the Lord on, and you and I are not the Holy Spirit in their lives. Okay? I've seen the effects and subsequent repercussions of someone doing that, going off. This was actually an individual who went off their medication on their own without a word from the Lord. They just, you know, their heart was right. They, they were going to believe in faith, but they didn't have a word from the Lord, and it was pretty bad circumstances. It could have been a lot worse if medical attention wasn't there and available. Um, they need to hear specifically from him on the timing to stop whatever medications or routines that they were prescribed and not to do it because they or we think they should. Again, it goes back to the manufacturer knowing what's best for the equipment they've designed. Amen? Let me pray for you guys real quick. Lord, I just praise you for this group. I praise you that they have a heart to heal. I praise you that they are bold. They are righteous and they are bold. They are not fearful to take on the enemy in the realm of healing. But they will, this, this today has empowered them, it's emboldened them to go out and pray for the sick. They're going to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. They're going to be compassionate. They're going to seek your wisdom when they pray for someone. They're going to speak the word and they're going to commend, they're going to commend that individual or that group of people to the word of your grace. They're going to remember that they're not the healer you are. And their job is just to take the authority you've given us, like a corporate credit card with our name on it, and use that authority in this realm. They're going to be bold. Bold, 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 and, and signs and wonders will follow. I'm just speaking that this group, as they go out and start praying for people, they're going to start seeing results. You're not going to, it's, it's going to be, they're going to, it's going to, what it's going to do, it's going to start a wildfire in their heart, Lord. It's going to, they're going to start praying for people. It's going to become addictive. They're going to start praying for people's healing. And it's like, man, i got to do that again. i got to minister God's healing and love again. I've got to do that again. Not to fulfill my own needs, but because I want to I want to do this for the Lord. I want to set these people free. And I just speak that that's going to start tonight, Lord. You're going to start working in their hearts. You're, you're giving them strength inside. You're giving them confidence inside. And again, it's confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I thank you for your time. I went a little bit over there. Um, but I hope you got something out of it. This was really, I feel like, what the Lord wanted you to, to hear in regards to healing. Um, you know, if you have any questions um, when we eat or after the evening service, I'm happy to talk to you. Our whole team is happy to talk to you. We have some that work in the prayer uh, phone center that I mentioned. We have some that uh, help serve at our healing school. These are all excellent, well-trained ministers, and um, they're going to graduate in a few months. Be licensed ministers. They're licensed. Dangerous for the, the enemy of darkness. Pastor? Amen. Phil's going to nip off soon and pick up the tea for those who's ordered it. Now, I know some people are not here for the evening. If you do need prayer, um, well, basically, grab them now. <laughs> Go for it. Any of these guys, students will pray for you and then later on, I mean, unless you, if you're really hurting and you can't board wait until later, great, grab them now. Yes. In fact, if you want healing, grab them now. Yeah. The rest of us will just cook teas and whatever. Yeah. Grab us tea. Yeah. Seven o'clock tonight is the start of the next one. Is that fine? Yeah. Okay, let's go for it.